Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Microsoft One Commercial Partner Cloud Growth and Profitability Webinar. You have joined us for the Selling or Buying a Partner Business event series. My name is Siam, and I will be your moderator today. This web conference is going to be recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. If you do not consent to be part of a recorded session, please disconnect your browser now. Attendees can access the web conference on-demand recording at the same registration site within 24 hours. We encourage you to use the messages panel today at any time to ask questions regarding the content that's been presented or to request support. To do so, please click on the messages button at the bottom of your screen, type your question into the white box and click on send. We will also be using the messages tab to post announcements to the audience. Our presenters today will be responding to questions at the end of our event, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time during this session. We will post two polling questions at the beginning of the event, so when a polling question appears on the left side of your screen, please select the appropriate <coughs> response and click on the Submit button. With that, I do appreciate your patience during our announcements, and you will hear a brief pause while I start my recording. Hello, and welcome to today's webcast. You have joined us for the Selling or Buying a Partner Business event series, and we are presenting today our second session titled Best Practices for Buying Another Partner Business. Kicking us off today from Microsoft, we have Jeannie Hoban, who is a Partner Channel Marketing Manager. Now it's my pleasure to hand you over. Jeannie, you now have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Siam. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. As Siam mentioned, I am a Partner Channel Marketing Manager here at Microsoft, really focused on partner profitability for our U.S. partners. This is the second in a series that we're doing. Um, so if you missed last week's, that's now available on demand at the same link where you came to register for this session. Um, and for those of you who did join last session, thank you so much for coming back today. So today I'm excited to welcome Mike Harbath and Dennis Dimka to the call. You know, we often hear from partners that they're interested in thinking about uh, acquiring another partner business as part of their growth strategy, but really they aren't sure where to get started on that conversation, what they should be thinking about, who they should be engaging with. And so we've got today our M&A expert, Mike Harbath, who is the CEO of Revenue Rocket. They're a company that supports partners through M&A transactions, and they work on both sides, although today we're mainly going to be focusing on the buy, sorry, the buy side. And then we're also joined by Dennis Dimka. Dennis is the CEO of Uptime Legal Systems, and he's a Microsoft partner who focuses on the legal vertical. Um, back in 2015, really uh, did a specialization focus to, um, re, uh, to, to rethink their business in terms of that legal vertical. And once they had done that, they really started looking at opportunities for growing their business through acquisition, and they did an adjacency uh, acquisition of Juris Page back in 2016 to offer some additional services within that same vertical. So Dennis is here today and going to share with us his experience of this process, as well as some best practices that he learned throughout that, um, throughout that process. So as I mentioned, today's session is the second of three, so be sure to join us this coming Thursday for our final session in the series where we're going to dive deeper into the sell side. Um, and then following today's content, we are going to reserve 15 minutes for Q&A. So please, throughout the presentation, go ahead and submit your questions, and we will share those up to Mike and Dennis at the end of the session. Now, before I hand it over to Mike to get into the real content today, let's start with a couple of polling questions. So if you'll see on your screen, on the left-hand side, a polling question should be coming up. Here we go. Okay, so have you ever been involved in an acquisition in the past? So we've got a few answers for you here. Yes, I've acquired another company. Yes, my company has been bought. Uh, yes, I was employed by a company while they were going through some sort of acquisition, but I wasn't specifically leading it. Or no, I've never been involved in any type of acquisition before. And we're going to show those results that are coming in. Um, so yes, we've got quite a few folks who say that they've acquired another company, so it's great to see. 
Um, a good number of folks who've never been involved in this before and a few on each side um, of the other. All right, so the next question that we're gonna pull up here is are you considering buying another partner in the next 12 months? So yes, I'm interested in acquiring another partner, maybe still considering your options. Uh, you know, it's a possibility, but you're just, you're really trying to figure it out. Um, and finally, maybe you're just, I'm not planning on um, a transaction in the next 12 months, but eh, maybe further down the line, just kind of here to uh, see <coughs> uh, what your options are. All right, and we've kind of got across the board here, so I'm gonna show you those results. Um, so most folks still considering their options, well, you're on the right webinar today for that. Um, so fantastic, uh, but great to see that there are a few folks who are planning on that. I think you're gonna find that uh, today's session is very helpful for you um, as you're making those choices. All right, and with that, I am gonna hand it over to Mike Harvath, who's gonna get into the meat of today's content. Great, thanks Jenny, appreciate it very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and I look forward to uh, kind of taking the audience through the content about and learning more about best practices for buying another firm. A little bit about Revenue Rocket. Um, we are uh, the premier growth strategy consultancy and M&A brokerage firm uh, in the partner ecosystem. Uh, we focus exclusively on IT services companies. We've worked with about 450 firms globally since our inception 16 years ago. Um, and really all of our team have uh, are long in the tooth uh, in the Microsoft partner ecosystem, <clears throat> all having at least 20 years of experience uh, with Microsoft partner businesses. It, you know it's time to buy um, is really what we're talking about today. Um, it is a great time to buy. We want to give you a little background on the current landscape in the IT uh, industry. Uh, we are in a $4.4 trillion industry, so it's a, it's a massive industry. And when you look at deals that get done, um, you know, 80% of all deals are in firms under 40 million in revenue. And an interesting stat that, that we learned recently is that 40% of all deals uh, are done in firms under 5 million in revenue. Uh, so it's just a tremendous number of deals um, that are, are done in the, you know, sort of smaller firms. Um, and expected to grow, these numbers actually proved out to be the case, 15% M&A growth in 15 uh, year over year. Uh, and it's continued on between 10 and 15% since then. A couple things to consider, you know, M&A is a critical ingredient for partner growth and expansion. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Obviously, there's a lot of competition uh, and a consolidation um, that is being is driving the sort of fragmentation, right? The fragmentation is driving the, the competition and consolidation in the industry. That's going to continue to be the case. Uh, if any of you have been followers of Revenue Rocket, you know that we believe that sort of a go big or go vertical or go home sort of a, approach. Um, we're uh, big believers in uh, sort of verticalization and specialization, and Dennis will be able to talk more about his own experience from that perspective. And we also know that it's easier to buy than build. Um, when you start to look at return on investment, return on cash and, and equity, um, that it's much easier to grow your firm through an acquisition, uh, frankly, than it is to grow it organically. A little bit about uh, when to buy. Uh, when your firm is larger than $5 million in revenue, uh, when you have a clear organic growth strategy, the focus is on the balance between growth and profit, uh, your revenue is growing, um, you're, you really are best in class when it comes to profit realization process, and your vertical markets are well-defined, you're financially healthy, you have little or no long-term debt, and you're in a position to take some risk. Um, you know, M&A does come with risk, right? There, there are things that occur when you buy another firm. You need to integrate it properly. We'll talk more about integration and some of those risks and concerns as we move through the presentation. And ultimately, you have an, a desire to accelerate your growth beyond your organic trajectory. A little about why, why to buy, right? Um, obviously, to get your goals faster with less risk is a, is a key reason. Um, and either to expand your service line and or geographic coverage is another reason. Um, get access to new talent. Obviously, we're in a uh, uh, situation where, you know, in the IT services and partner community, 
um, you know, we're in a sort of a negative unemployment situation. Um, there is far more opportunity than there is talent. So it's clearly a way to get additional talent inside of your business. Um, also an opportunity to leverage an adjacency market opportunity. And, and uh, Dennis will talk more about he, how he did that in his transaction. It'll highlight later in the presentation. And it also provides a way to have more business continuity options. I think, you know, we as an advisory firm and as an M&A uh, uh, firm see uh, business continuity or, or lack of business continuity plans to be a significant issue for the partner community. Um, and oftentimes being able to do an acquisition can further fortify your continuity strategy uh, and, you know, sort of help you build the business beyond yourself. A little about who to buy. Um, you know, a partner like you that sort of expands your market coverage is a logical option. And you'll see many, um, many deals like this uh, be announced uh, and are announced fairly regularly. Um, and you'll also see deals where uh, you can buy a partner that will expand your service line. Uh, and we see that as people begin to uh, want to, you know, offer service lines to their existing customer base that they don't currently offer. Uh, we've seen many of those deals also uh, over the years. Obviously, a partner with a complementary offering uh, is one that we think uh, we don't see as many of, but but one that I think a smart um, a smart entrepreneur uh, who's running a partner should consider. Um, and then clearly, you want to buy a partner who's healthy. Uh, financially and growing. Uh, we don't think that buying uh, damaged partners, frankly, is the right strategy. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but primarily, uh, you want to be able to ar architect the path to a healthy internal rate of return. Um, and it's challenging to do that with a partner who's flagging or uh, someone who's having trouble financially. And our experience has been that when you do that, um, when you buy a partner or a business that's struggling, uh, you oftentimes have so many skeletons in the closet that you didn't know about that you will always put more money in to make that turnaround than you anticipated. It's almost a universal truth. And obviously you need to find a partner that fits strategically, culturally, and financially. You kind of call this the three-legged stool of M&A or the three pillars of M&A. Um, you wouldn't find a partner that didn't fit strategically or you wouldn't be looking at them. Culturally is critically important in understanding how that culture will fit for you. And obviously the financial transaction is uh, equally important. A little bit about um, multiples uh, and trends in IT services. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what are the multiples, what are deals trading at, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see a variety of different data points on this. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, how um, the multiples uh, work for your given transaction. And so I, you know, I, I often caution um, our clients as well as the marketplace in general to understand that even multiples are just comparative in nature and they're not valuations. So don't look at your business and say, well, in the last year or month or five years or whatever it is, you know, I should expect X, Y, Z, EBITDA multiple. Or next year, I'm going to do this, so my business should be worth ABC. It's simply just a comparative number. Um, also, the only relevant uh, number, really, as you look at how um, multiples may work, is really profitability. Um, revenue multiples are not relevant uh, because they're simply comparative in nature. And the reason why that mo many deals are reported on a revenue multiple basis is because private companies don't want to disclose profit uh, and disclose EBITDA multiples. And so oftentimes you'll hear uh, comparative or press or things reported about transactions on a revenue multiple basis. But it's simply a way to, to you know, look at a comparative benchmark. Um, it's also, you know, to do a little myth busting here, not about length of contracts. Um, there's some advisors in the industry that talk about um, the value of your business being based on the number of reoccurring contracts that you have. And I think this is a little bit of a sucker's game because, frankly, 
Um, you know, unless you're in the business of suing your clients uh, if they want to leave, um, you're, you know, it's it's not uh, it's it's not really about the length of your contracts. Now, it is about the stability of your revenue, and I think long-term contracts do create a stable revenue environment, which is valuable, uh, and usually that's valued based on a forecasted, um, you know, risk adjustment versus uh, just looking at the contract lengths. And then, as we said before, multiples tend to pivot around strategic fit, sort of the blend of reoccurring revenue and profit, and then the blend of upfront cash versus delayed payout. Uh, multiples can vary wildly based on deal structure. Um, and, you know, substantial uh, discounts are applied, frankly, for an all-cash deal. Uh, likewise, substantial premiums that would be paid if there's more risk taken on behalf of a seller. How much should you pay? Um, it's really, we talked about this before, it's really all about internal rate of return and ROI timelines. Um, we believe that the walkaway number um, is five years. The pivot point is around a five-year return on investment or an IRR over or, or under 20%. Um, we learned uh, as an advisor, I learned uh, from a, a very large family office uh, that we did some work with and helping them buy some uh, Microsoft partner businesses, actually, um, that um, they were able to create a over $4 billion um, of value uh, for that family office within one generation by s focusing on this simple principle, which was, and they bought over 80 companies, bought and sold over 80 companies. And when they did that, they, they, they said, look, if we can get to our IRR timeline and the other things line up around um, cultural fit, uh, strategic fit, cultural fit, and then ultimately this is financial fit, then we'll do the transaction. We don't get too augured into is it this multiple or this valuation or, you know, we feel like we're overpaying because those IRR multiples or those IRR percentages have so much to do with what each party brings to the table ultimately to gain in post-transaction, sort of the one plus one equals three. To that end, we can look at, at uh, multiples. This is some brand new data we received recently um, that Q2 2017 average deal multiples uh, in um, IT services are, and this is a global number, are at about 1.1 times revenue and 9.8 times trailing 12 months EBITDA. I would caution you to uh, look and read too much into this because this includes all deals, including the large deals where there's a public company multiple lift. Uh, and typically, uh, and it's graded based on, um, based on dollar volume. So those larger deals tend to lift this number. Um, typically, we see deals trade for smaller companies, and we define smaller companies as those being under 50 million in revenue uh, in the sort of seven, eight times trailing EBITDA multiple. And then again, 2017 numbers um, are currently exceeding a 10% year-over-year trajectory uh, from a growth perspective. A little bit about, um, you know, how deal structure impacts payout. Um, you can see here that, you know, uh, in 2016, the average IT sector deal was 60% guaranteed consideration, or what we would consider cash. It may not all be a closing, but it's guaranteed consideration and 40% performance-based payout. Some people refer to this as earnout. Um, and uh, as an interesting aside, you know, 76% of the time earnouts get paid out at or above their index expected payout level. So um, that's uh, something to consider when you're structuring a deal as a buyer. Um, that you'll, if you're structuring an earnout, and oftentimes buyers like earnouts because it mitigates their risk on a particular acquisition, um, you're likely to overpay or pay more, I shouldn't say overpay, but pay more uh, for that transaction than you might if you structure the deal differently. And so uh, you need to be uh, sensitive to that. If the deal works, you're going to pay a premium for it uh, because of how that gain share uh, operates. Some buyers are okay with that. Some buyers have a sort of a um, a negative surprise when you know they get what they wish for, if you will. Uh, they acquire a company and they're very successful with it, and, and in the end, they end up paying a you know very significant uh, price 
uh, because of that gain share uh, that uh, helped them mitigate risk up front. Sort of how to make it all work. Um, boy, as you can see, the M&A process is a complex, uh, a complex one. Um, these this, um, bubble chart sort of talks to the various roles of the buyer um, and the M&A advisor. Um, and if you'd like to dig deeper into this, you certainly can obviously watch this recording or, or uh, see this uh, presentation uh, as it's uploaded to the archive. Um, but it, as you can see, there's a, a tremendous hand-in-glove uh, relationship that occurs with an advisor moving through readiness, sort of prospect pursuit, letter of intent, due diligence, and then into definitive agreement. Um, and it's important to realize that um, as you uh, go through that process and ultimately to post-merger integration, um, that it takes a village to really get these deals done. These are very challenging to get done um, on your own. Um, and just, you know, to kind of put the stats out there, you have less than a 1% chance of getting an MA, a buy-side M&A transaction done if you try to architect it uh, on your own. That's why there's a group of advisors and legal and accounting and M&A advisors out there to help. Successful transactions um, really revolve around these three things, right? They revolve around culture fit, um, which has to do with business philosophy, core value, customer care philosophy, and employee care philosophy. Critically important, if there's a single leg of this stool that can blow up a deal, uh, post-transaction or have it miss its IRR targets or return on investment thresholds, it's a misalignment in culture fit. You certainly don't want to learn after you've done a deal that you want to back your car over the principal of the company you just bought because you can't work with them. It's, it's a situation where you need to be clear about the culture fit and make sure you see the world in the same way and that you're able to solve the problems that inevitably will come up with them uh, in a, uh, in a, from a similar culture perspective. Obviously, you're not going to do a deal that doesn't have strong strategic fit or strategic synergies. Um, it, the one plus one really needs to be more than two. We often use the term, you know, can one plus one equal three or more? Uh, and it really needs to do that. And it's important that you know what you're bringing to the table and not just that you want to buy a company. Because when someone is selling their business to you, in many ways they're selling in. And when they lean in and sell in, they need to know sort of what's in it for them beyond the dollars and cents. Uh, we see a lot of buyers that uh, focus on, well, I have dollars and someone's selling their business and they should be happy to sell me their business for this you know, financial consideration. Uh, particularly in the Microsoft partner community, we see it uh, to be critical that you have a very clear understanding of, of what you're bringing to the table. Um, want to make sure that there's good business process alignment and that, you know, there's IP. Uh, if you're doing a strategic acquisition, if there's IP, that it fits and can be valuable within your organization and your go-to-market strategy. Again, financial fit. Sellers receiving typically um, in partners under 50 million, six to nine times, as we talked about before, seven to eight is pretty typical. Um, and you want to be, uh, in, from a buyer perspective, have an internal rate of return greater than 20%, which is, again, less than a five-year payback. A little bit about post-merger integration. Uh, post-merger integration is um, uh, clearly a uh, critical area. Um, if you look at the two main um, areas that an M&A, uh, a buy-side M&A transaction can fail to meet expectations, uh, they're reported as a failure to understand the cultural fit uh, components like we talked about earlier, and a failure of post-merger integration execution. Okay, so oftentimes because it's difficult to get these deals done, uh, people spend almost all of their energy on getting the transaction over the line and negotiating all, all the hundreds of things that need to be negotiated and very little time on integration planning. And, you know, a wish is not a plan, right? You need to have a very comprehensive plan. Um, obviously, your integration must have clear and quantifiable goals and objectives with incentives tied to those. 
Uh, and it can be simple incentives, whether that be celebration type incentives or incentives around achieving certain milestones, but it needs to be uh, managed. Uh, you need to manage and begin post-merger integration planning within six to eight weeks before closing. Um, we've seen many firms make this mistake um, and ultimately it costs them, uh, it can cost them as much as six months in thrashing around integration post-close if they don't take on post-merger integration pre-close. This also may be, and we've seen this be this case in, in, uh, in some deals where you begin post-merger integration planning and you realize that the deal just isn't going to realize the return rates that you thought. And as a result, you shouldn't do the deal, right? So this is a, it adds a lot of, um, a, a lot of light um, and a lot of clarity to whether this is the right transaction. And in many ways, it should be seen as a due diligence activity. Um, I think if, if post-merger integration is done properly, um, you typically can see less than 2% employee and customer turnover, and we typically see a much lower number. And I know this is a big concern for buyers, Hey, you know, what happens if the key employees leave or what happens if, you know, we have a bunch of customers exit or whatever. We just don't see this to be the case, provided you've done a good job in post-merger integration planning. And obviously, M&A is only a win if both parties win. And this should be the cornerstone of not only how you negotiate, but how you plan uh, to uh, take the deal forward. There are very few win-lose uh, scenarios uh, in m a that that work right even for the quote unquote winner uh, typically when you approach uh, both integration diligence and negotiations as win lose uh, you're not going to get to the return rates you expect and with that I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Stimka uh, CEO of uptime for his story Dennis yeah thank you Mike for that introduction um, so yes, I am the CEO of Uptime Legal Systems, and I'll talk a little bit about um, my M&A journey, my sort of my story. Um, oops, I jumped back here, um, which follows and really parallels a lot of what Mike said. You know, a lot of the stuff that he kind of shared with me, kind of before going to that process, uh, absolutely proved to be true from all, all the stuff he talks about. Um, uh, post-merger integration to, you know, uh, M&A only works when it's a win-win for both parties. I mean, all, all very true. So we'll talk a little bit about our story and some of the lessons learned there um, in our case. So first, I'll start with a brief background on Uptime Legal, kind of who we are and who we were. Um, so I founded Uptime Legal in 2005. Um, at that time, really, is a pretty, pretty pure play MSP, later kind of evolved into a CSP. Um, our headquarters was and is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today we have an office in uh, New York City, which is the, the product of an acquisition. So our, um, our journey over the last five years was a journey uh, that really brought us from a $1 million top-line company to a $5 million top-line company. Um, and that really came through, you know, people ask me all the time, what was, what's the secret or what's the thing? And it's, it's hard to answer that every time, but, you know, one of the big things is specialization and verticalization without a doubt. And another piece of that is, and I think will be, um, an acquisitive strategy in addition to organic growth. Um, so today, Uptime Legal specializes in cloud services uh, for the legal industry. Uh, and in that same journey, we sort of evolved from a local MSP generalist to a national uh, legal technology specialist. Along the way, we've uh, won some awards that I'm pretty proud of. Um, we just recently found out that we made the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in America for the fourth consecutive year. Uh, that just came out, those of you who follow that. And those of you who uh, apply or, or do that, you know that it actually gets harder and harder every year because it's, it's measured in velocity and percentage growth over three years. Um, other awards that I'm very proud of is uh, the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year uh, finalist. Um, back in 2015, we were the MSP mentor number one uh, in the 501. And then, of course, the RCP Rocket Award, which uh, recognizes excellence and growth. Um, there are others, too, but those are the ones that, uh, that are my personal favorites. So in terms of M&A activity, um, we have done, uh, to, to date, one deal. 
Um, and uh, just a little over a year ago, we closed on our acquisition of a company called JurisPage, which is a great company. Uh, and as Mike sort of alluded to, it was an adjacency acquisition. It wasn't just a, uh, not to say just, but it wasn't a smaller version of us. Uh, and in that case, the strategy was that it gave us a new offering or a new segment that we could sell into, but within our same vertical. So today, our offerings are, broadly speaking, technology services to law firms. And really within that very kind of broad umbrella, our, our core offerings are private cloud, uh, which is today our bread and butter, uh, document management, uh, which is our own product, our own IP that we developed and, and sell into that same industry, and of course, internet marketing for law firms, which again came from that acquisition of JurisPage. So I'll talk a little bit about our M&A story, um, kind of how, how it went down, what it felt like to kind of be kind of from my perspective in, in the sort of driver's seat. Um, so this is kind of how we approached it. Uh, the very first step for us was to ensure that we were ready to acquire. Um, you know, as Mike talks about, we, wanted to, we, we looked and double-checked that we were financially healthy, profitable, growing, upward trajectory, minimal debt, all that stuff. Uh, then the next thing we need to really make sure and ask ourselves and sort of look into the mirror and ask is, are our business systems and process pretty airtight? You know, you always hear about, you know, build your business like you're going to franchise it and, and, you know, be very process-centric. That's how you scale. Uh, and without that, I, um, I, I believe uh, that, you know, if you are a business without a lot of process and systems in place and you acquire another company that maybe also doesn't have that, you're kind of combining two messes. So it was very important that we had a system to kind of plug uh, a target into. Um, and then the other thing was to make sure that we had a very clear and simple, simple to articulate, strategic business plan that an acquisition would fit into. And that's critically important, obviously, with or without an acquisition, but really, really important, especially with an acquisition on your radar, because otherwise it's hard to know if an acquisition makes sense strategically if you don't have a clear strategic plan. So next, um, we kind of sat down and defined our goals in an acquisition, which might sound a little um, self-evident, but not always. Um, you know, what are you really hoping to acquire from this acquisition? And in our case, we wanted uh, any combination of the following um, in no particular order. We wanted to grow revenue by adding or acquiring clients. So in other words, buy a book of revenue. Um, you know, as Mike talked about, we wanted to add talent with, uh, with expertise in our vertical. There are lots of talented technologists out there, but there are fewer legal technologists, and that's the vertical in the industry we're in, and that can be challenging to, to find the right people. So that was a big part of it. We were open to, open to adding a new adjacent offering that complemented our existing offerings and fit within that same vertical. Um, and, of course, financially, as Mike talked about, we wanted to achieve an, an annual return of at least 20% or better. Um, any, I, and there's a whole host of reasons you could say that, but for us, it was kind of like, well, if there's a, if there's a deal that's only going to yield, say, 10% IRR, what's the point? I could go buy mutual funds. So that was, that was part of the strategy for us. And, and really, once, once we defined those goals, I really saw two potential paths. Uh, either would have been, would have been uh, or could have been a win. One was uh, find and acquire a smaller version of us, right, a mini uptime legal, a company that does MSP and or CSP services with some foothold in the legal industry. So in that scenario, we're essentially acquiring a book and a team. Uh, or buy a company in an adjacent space, you know, one degree of separation away from what we do in the same vertical, but one but not too far from our core offering. Those are the two things that uh, I was sort of open to when we started looking at different companies. So once we kind of were ready and had all that mapped out and understood exactly what we wanted and exactly kind of what the process was going to be, we jumped in. And we really went down that kind of that chart that Mike showed of the talking to different prospects, uh, signing NDAs with people who were interested in talking, kind of diving a little deeper after that, evaluating companies, looking at financials, getting a sense of each potential targets forecast, uh, which as, as, a, as an aside was a really fun and, uh, and uh, educational uh, exercise for me. I got to look at financials for companies that were doing pretty well, companies that maybe there was some room for improvement, and it was really eye-opening because, you know, up until this point, I had really only seen our own financials that close anyway. Um, but really what you're looking for, of course, in these, when you're talking to companies, looking at the financial, looking at the cultural fit and the strategic fit, is to try to find where the accretive value is or at least could be. 
So in our case, after having gone through that process and, and engaging with a handful of companies, uh, we, we eventually found the company that I thought was the best overall fit, strategically, financially, and culturally, and that, of course, was uh, JurisPage. So JurisPage was and is an awesome company that does web design and Internet marketing exclusively to law firms, uh, so SEO, PPC, that sort of thing. And it really was that kind of one degree away, that perfect fit. It was a what I'll call a technology, maybe not a technology company, but a technology-enabled company. And in our case, it was a great way to expand and monetize across the full client life cycle. And what I mean by that is being, becoming more than, quote, just another IT or just another CSP company, right? A full service provider. We've, um, you know, we had been in the business of helping our clients kind of manage and support their firms, and now we help them grow their practices, which is really rewarding and really makes us more of a, uh, a key partner to them, more than just the IT group. Uh, and I don't mean to say just, I mean, that's obviously uh, the cornerstone of our business, but it really helped kind of enrich our relationship with our clients and prospective clients. Uh, so today, fast forward, uh, Juris Page, uh, a little bit over a year later, is a division of Uptime Legal. It's essentially our internet marketing agency. It's growing, it's profitable, it's a great addition to our team uh, and in really every way. And it fits, most importantly in my opinion, it fits really well into our overall company strategy. It fits well into our BHAG, into our long-term growth strategy. So, um, what lessons did I learn along that process? Uh, some of these were lessons that I learned anew at that time. Others were lessons that I sort of expected or were advised and absolutely found to be true. And while there's, I could probably talk about lessons learned for a long time, here are some of the key ones from my perspective. Um, and some of these lessons are more advice than lessons that I would give myself uh, or, or another person looking to do this. First one is absolutely implement a business operating system, whether it's Rockefeller Habits or EOS from Traction, which are very, very similar. Um, and the reason that's so important is it really gives you an existing framework to plug your acquired company into from how to measure, uh, how to measure success in terms of metrics and, and, and critical numbers to ex executive rhythms, management rhythms, all you know, from the big picture stuff down to the nuts and bolts. It gives you a system to plug into, and I think that's critically important. Um, it's also important to kind of define your ideal target. You know, make up, and this is what we did, uh, make up a, a fictitious hypothetical company and sort of describe them. What, what is their revenue? What is their margin? Uh, what services do they offer? What kind of culture are they? Um, you know, and that sort, of becomes, and that sort of becomes your perfect world ideal that, of course, no real target will ever meet, but it gives you something to hold people you're actually talking to up against. Um, another, another useful tool that was really useful for us is understand the gaps in your current leadership team. Um, and ideally, in a, in a nearly perfect world, you would find a seller who, who really fits that gap. In our specific case, we lacked a true kind of CMO or, or director of marketing role in our company. And um, of course, we were acquiring a, a company in the business of marketing, so that, that was a natural fit and really created uh, some, some accretive value for us. Probably goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Know your numbers um, in terms of, you know, understand how to value companies. Um, if you, you don't have to necessarily be able to do a DCF model yourself, but understand how to look at companies, understand, you know, what Mike talked about, which is, you know, a seller is going to want to get seven to eight times EBITDA. You want about a, a 5X return or 20% IRR. Understand that, and then when you're looking at the financials of a company, understand if this can get you there or not. Um, I'm a little bit repeating what Mike said here, but definitely, definitely develop a comprehensive integration plan. Um, you know, we mapped out to the best of our ability every single task and to-do we could think of in every functional area, from marketing to communications to integrating business systems, which, by the way, is the easy part. Um, really map it all out and then put together a team of integrators, an integration team made up of members from both sides of the deal. Uh, it gets buy-in. It gets everybody excited, um, and uh, that's critical. Here's another big one. Um, communicate why the merger makes sense to the entire combined company, to the entire team. Make sure that everybody understands from the, the leadership, the middle management, to the rank and file understands why this deal makes sense, why the new combined company is better than the sum of its parts, and what, why, why it is happening, you know, why, why it makes sense. Again, it's about buying and it, it's about getting everybody excited. This is a good thing. This is a major milestone for both companies and it's something to be excited about. 
And last but not least, um, get an experienced M&A advisor. Uh, it's funny to me, um, but I've talked to companies who have done, been on either the buy or the sell side that only had attorneys or only had accountants helping them, um, which is really just a piece of it. Um, uh, an experienced M&A advisor will, certainly in my experience, help deals get done. Um, because through the process, especially as you're negotiating LOIs or the definitive agreement or whatever the process is, you're going to get stuck multiple times on things. And they may be small, fussy things, and people tend to get entrenched on both sides, in fairness. And you really need somebody to sort of be the, the broker for the deal, the me not the mediator, but the, the person who can really get it across the finish line in a way where everybody still wins. Um, and that's just one part of why an, a good advisor is critical. But those are... Um, those are kind of some of the key lessons I learned in our, in our M&A story. It was quite an adventure, and uh, I think we'll definitely be doing it again. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. You can obviously uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, of Dennis as we uh, move through this <clears throat> the last few slides. So, uh, so we're going to talk to some key takeaways um, for um, the presentation. Um, and as you can see, unfortunately, we got pushed back to the beginning of the presentation. But uh, if you can give me just a second here, we'll get to the appropriate slide. Um, some of the key takeaways I think that are critically important to remember as you guys are looking at embarking on your own buy side initiative uh, include being able to um, be clear about your organic growth strategy and make sure your buy side effort complements that strategy. Dennis talked to, to that, but I think oftentimes people think about buy side M&A as a way to solve some of the chinks in the armor in their organic strategy, and that's just the wrong way to think about it. Um, we've uh, worked with a few firms that have tried to do that, tried to fortify their strategy through an acquisition uh, we think that's a mistake uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about. Uh, obviously, vet the seller's culture and measure the fit with your organization. And we think this should happen um, by spending time with the people. It's the best way to do that. So everyone, I think, uh, I'd like to say almost everyone, it's probably a universal truth, um, within, um, you know, IT services and the Microsoft partner community, are pretty darn good. Um, uh, pretty pretty good darn, uh, good at evaluating other people, right? Uh, they have to be right to be in this business. Now, whether that be talent or whether that be you know customers or they're good at reading people. And being able to get in a room uh, with a seller and sit down and talk to them about what's important to them uh, is critical. And I often say that you'll know uh, when you're vetting a culture of a selling firm. Uh, within the first 10 minutes, whether the deal's going to work or not. Um, I think your, your, uh, that little voice inside you will tell you, hey, I could really work with these guys and I like these guys, or there's a lingering question, right? And you really need to be prepared to act on that. Be ready or get ready, right? Uh, be ready has everything to do with kind of getting your own house in order. Um, and uh, if it's not in order, then you really need to focus on getting ready. And this is a critical component because we've had this conversation with a few uh, folks in our, in our client base over the years that um, make sure you're clear about what you bring to the table in a transaction beyond the dollars. Um, how does one plus one equal three? Super important. Uh, if you can't articulate that clearly to a seller, then you shouldn't be in the market to look to buy a company. Forget the multiples and focus on IRR. Again, highly strategic deals uh, are ones that look at the internal rate of return. And when you think about deals where uh, companies pay from the outside, you look at it and you say, wow, how can they possibly afford to pay that for that company? The reason they can is because they have a clear focus on how that internal rate will work. There's so much strategic synergy and so much potential uh, with that combination that it gets them in a place they can't get on their own. And thus that tends to drive those types of uh, purchase price. And obviously leverage, leverage your advisors to get a deal done. Dennis mentioned that. There's hundreds of things to negotiate. It shouldn't be daunting. 
but you have to rem- you have to manage a relationship with the seller post transaction, mm-hmm. even if it's a relatively short period of time uh, in which you will be um, uh, working with them. Let's say they're transitioning out of the business within six months. You need to be able to maintain a working relationship. That that relationship can get damaged in the negotiation uh, because from time to time um, there's going to be a little bit of pushing and shoving uh, in order to come to the right transaction. A win-win deal, uh, frankly, is one where everyone feels like they gave too much um, and uh, in the end um, will require a little bit of, will require compromise on both sides. And then just go get it done. A little bit about a special offer we have. This is an M&A readiness review. Uh, it's a one-month engagement. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you have some interest in looking at or, or gauging whether you're ready, um, looking at the value of your business today based on a market-based valuation, uh, trying to figure out how big a target you can actually acquire in your business, uh, then just drop us a note, uh, and we'll be happy to reach out to you and talk more about how we can help you with this. It does come at a 50% savings. It's normally a $10,000 investment. You can have it all done for you for 5K. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jenny for Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we've had some great questions coming in, but just a quick reminder, keep them coming. Um, we want to you know, get as many of your questions answered as possible. All right, so I'm going to start off with the first one we got. Um, In terms of the acquisition, I think we're specifically talking to Dennis here about your acquisition. Can you share how it was funded? Was this purely from the balance sheet, or did you have outside funding that was used? Good question. Uh, It was a leveraged buyout, so it was a combination of cash from the balance sheet as well as uh, uh, borrowed money. And Mike, from your end, you know, do you have any guidance on that, what you would recommend to folks or, or things that they should be thinking about uh, given their, you know, if, if they're in a particular situation, is there one thing you would recommend over the other? Well, certainly um, cash is king, right? And if you can, um, you know, the most efficient way to acquire a company is through uh, cash in your balance sheet if you have it. Um However, uh, almost all deals will require some sort of financing um, and debt financing, whether that's from a bank or whether that's from a seller or a combination, uh, is preferred. And the reason that is is it's just purely the cost of capital, right? Um, right now, money is uh, uh, pretty pretty available, uh, and it's relatively inexpensive, right? It's easy and inexpensive to borrow money. Uh, and as long as you can acquire a firm um, that will perform reasonably well after the acquisition, you can cash flow uh, those acquisitions uh, sort of through the acquisition itself. Um, and, and we think that is the right way to do it. Certainly, you can raise money through equity, uh, selling equity, um, but that's a much more expensive um, way to raise money. Uh, and we don't want to get into a big conversation about what's the right way or wrong way to do it. I just think the most efficient way uh, to do an acquisition clearly is through uh, leverage, and that's through leverage associated with um, uh, bank or seller financing. Great. Thanks, Mike. All right, our next question, and I believe, again, this one was specific to Dennis, um, is how did you actually locate your prospective acquisition? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, um, I'm a big believer in the saying, you can't know enough people. So I actually met this particular company and its two founders and then owners um, at a legal, legal technology trade show. And, you know, it's, it was kind of like, as Mike describes with the cultural fit, you'll know within 10 minutes. I knew within 10 minutes or less that I really liked these guys. They were sharp. They were hungry. They were ambitious. And I, you know, they, they, we, we call people who work here uptimers. They felt like uptimers, right? Uh, and I had no inkling of, of acquiring them at that time. But then later, not too much later, when I um, started getting into acquisitive mode and thinking about different kinds of companies, I thought of them, uh, kind of reached out sort of uh, as sort of a, just a, on a whim. And today, the rest is sort of history. Great. And then, Mike, from your end, I mean, do you have any recommendations for where folks can start on uh, looking for perspectives? Yeah, certainly. You know, I think uh, there's a couple ways to go about that. I mean, clearly, Dennis uh, 
you know, exemplified a, an approach that I think works well. But at the same time, you know, if you have a good profile in mind but don't have an exact target in mind, uh, the right m and advisor can run a process for you, right? They can find that firm that fits that profile. We kind of call it the ideal acquisition um, profile, right? They certainly can, can target many of them, take you through that qualifying process, get to a short list, move you through the, move you through the pipeline. Um, you know, Dennis had done some of that uh, as well and, and looking at the, he mentioned it in his process, looking at various companies. Um, certainly, it helps you refine sort of your thinking around strategy as well as to what is the ideal prospect. You may think it is a, a certain profile of a company, but after you begin having conversations with that profile, you realize that, well, you know, maybe strategically it's not perfect. Uh, and if it looked a little more like this or a little more like that, um, it would be better. And so the profile does expand and change and grow in that process as well. And we think that's a healthy effort. So certainly leverage your um, leverage an advisor to help you run that process down, um, as well as sort of using your personal network. Great, and uh, we've got a question, Mike, specifically I think for you, asking if you focus only on Microsoft services companies, or you know, do you focus on companies beyond that in terms of your M and A uh, support? No, our common thread is really IT services companies, and so we do uh, focus on um, IT services companies more broadly, uh, generally built around the major software companies' ecosystems um, as a common thread. Excellent. And I know we've got your email in there, so we can make sure that uh, any folks who are interested can follow up with Mike um, to learn more about the services that, uh, that they do offer. So we have a really interesting question here um, from a partner saying that uh, they've brought a number of possible deals to the table for their company, to their management, uh, because they, he feels like they're struggling with their organic growth and you know they've got some gaps. But his management team hasn't really seen any interest in uh, in taking this forward or or uh, this approach. He's kind of wondering how might he approach that better with his management team to uh, you know kind of bring this to the table and and actually try and move that forward. Good question. I think um, you know understanding the fact that. You know, the, if you look at the overall growth potential in the market, and there's been a variety of of uh, press about this, that you leave about 50% of your growth potential for growing the firm on the table without an active, acquisitive uh, effort going in the business. And what I mean by that, it doesn't mean that you're acquiring a company uh, a quarter or a year or whatever, but it's just one that you're thinking about or moving towards a trajectory of doing an acquisition and then actually executing against that uh, will it has proven to accelerate your growth. So said another way, companies that do acquisitions outperform from a growth strategy and profit realization perspective, uh, those that don't. Um, and uh, it's been quantified to sort of this 50% of the growth potential is being left on the table. So certainly you could talk to that. Um, I would keep in mind, though, that there may, may be many reasons why a management team chooses to not do an acquisition now, right? It may have a lot to do with uh, kind of getting their house in order, um, being in a position to fund an acquisition. Uh, if a balance sheet is levered up uh, for whatever reason due to other investments or other initiatives, um, they may have, uh, they may be consciously making a decision to not move on a transaction now as we talked about earlier in the presentation. So that's things to keep in mind as well. Fantastic. All right, and just one final question, uh, and then I'll close things out. So if someone's thinking about uh, doing a transaction in the next year, if they're looking at buying, what's the most important thing that they should be doing right now to prepare for that? Well, I, I think, um, and I'd love to get Dennis's opinion. Obviously, he uh, prepared and successfully conducted a transaction. Uh, you know, from our perspective, it's sort of the uh, get ready or be ready uh, recommendation, right? You know, fortify your financials and your processes uh, so that you're in a position to know exactly what makes sense, um, both from a, from a size perspective, um, 
sort of from a financial perspective, but also more importantly, from a strategic perspective, and then know what value you bring to the table in that conversation. Dennis, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I would say, I'll try to not repeat what I've uh, mentioned already too much, but, you know, have um, have your business systems and process in place. Uh, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be there. Uh, and then what I did just personally, was I sort of went through exercises of, as I described, mapping out what some different kinds of profiles or, or targets might look like, kind of doing, you know, in Excel, literally mapping out, okay, and if they're generating this much top line and this much bottom line, that means they're adding this much. So kind of going through the numbers and really understanding that, which number, which prepares you when you're doing that for real. And it sort of takes some of the fear and uncertainty out, so you can really just kind of laser in on what you might be looking at when you get time to talk to potential sellers. Fantastic. Very All nice. right. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for the, the Q&A. So I am just going to go ahead and close us out because we're getting close to the uh, top of the hour. So a quick reminder that we do have our final webinar in this series this coming Thursday um, that's going to focus on the sell side um, of the transaction. Um, so hope that you can all join us for that if you've got your interest there. Also, we do know that we're coming up on a long weekend, so uh, that will be available on demand as well within about two hours of the session. So if you want to follow up on that at your own convenience, we definitely understand. Now, if you have any other questions as you start to digest the content that you've heard today, or if you've got just more interest in talking about cloud growth and profitability, we do have two new groups that you can join. We've got a LinkedIn group and a Yammer group. And these are great places for you to come and ask Microsoft some questions, talk to your peers. We're going to be posting new resources and programs that we make available throughout the year here. Also, if there's anything that you're looking for from Microsoft and you're not finding it or you're not seeing a particular resource, that's a great place to post in your question, hey, do you guys have something like this? And if we do, I can tell you. And if we don't, then maybe it's something that we can help you build out um, or we can build out for the whole group. So um, please, you know, if you're interested, join those groups. We're also going to be starting some uh, uh, biweekly office hours um, in the near future, and we're going to announce those there. Again, a great opportunity for us to continue these type of topics. Um, and, and answer any more questions that you guys have. I also want to just do a quick call out on the survey. Um, it is extremely important to us to get your feedback on today's session, how we can do things better, um, other topics you might be interested in. Uh, we do go through your surveys in depth. We take those into account. Um, everything that we hear back from you, uh, we do look to uh, make sure in future we take those uh, that feedback into account. So please, please, please fill out the survey. Um, it's really short, only five questions. It'll take you a couple minutes only. So we really appreciate that. And then just quickly, I do want to mention, we've got a ton of resources at Microsoft to really help you around thinking about your profitability. Obviously, here we've got the Revenue Rocket um, link. You know, the, he does have that special offer um, that Mike's offering. We've got his email available to you. So reach out to him and, and take him up on that offer or chat to him about um, additional services that they have. And then I do have a few more resources, including the Modern Partner Profitability homepage. It's got a benchmark assessment around cloud profitability and some amazing resources around the cloud practice playbook. So if you've never looked at those before, I highly recommend going, checking them out, um, see what might work for you. Again, if you're seeing anything that you, you're not finding, let us know. Reach out to us at one of those groups or via email, um, and we'll make sure that you've got the resources you need to be the most profitable um, and, and growing as strongly as you can. And with that, we are at the top of the hour. So thank you all so much for joining today. Thank you so much, Mike and Dennis, for sharing um, on the buy side today. We really appreciate it. Again, complete the short survey. We'd really appreciate it. And then thank you, everyone, so much. Have a fantastic day.